And with that, I, I think we should go ahead and get started. We've got a number of folks here and we wanna make sure that we're making good use of everyone's time. Dr. Kendall, before I hand it off to you, I would just like to thank everyone for joining the Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force meeting. This is the fifth of our meetings. And I would also like to um, start with a tribal acknowledgement. Um, this is a message that we've shared ahead of most of our um, meetings. We would like to start the task force meeting with a tribal acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge the importance of tribal nations in this process. Our tribal partners are integral to achieving effective coordination around the future of offshore renewable energy in the Gulf of Mexico region. BOEM respects tribal sovereignty and self-governance and will continue to engage federally recognized tribes through government to government consultations. And with that, Dr. Kendall, I'll hand it over to you to formally welcome and convene the meeting. Well, thank you, Kyle. It's a pleasure to be here. First of all, uh, my uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Kendall, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Regional Director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management's Gulf of Mexico Regional Office. BOEM is the federal agency within the Department of Interior that manages energy, mineral, and geological resources on the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf, or as we say, the OCS. We're the lead agency that oversees offshore wind, our focus of the meeting today. Thank you for being here. We're excited to be hosting the fifth Gulf of Mexico Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. The purpose of this meeting is to update our task force members on offshore wind energy planning activities and to discuss the next steps in the BOEM leasing process, including the recently announced proposal for a second offshore wind lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, BOEM has identified four areas with the potential for leasing offshore Louisiana and Texas. All four areas can produce enough clean energy to power more than a million homes. This proposed sale is part of the Department of Interior strategy to increase responsible renewable energy development on public lands and offshore waters. In 2021, at the request of the state of Louisiana, BOEM held its first intergovernmental offshore wind task force. And now, three years later, we've published the proposed sale notice for a second sale with the comment period ending May 20th. Uh, the Gulf of Mexico is well positioned for a transition into renewable energy offshore. This region has directly supported the development of offshore oil and gas for the last 70 years. So we have the expertise, the experience, and the infrastructure needed to allow offshore wind energy to thrive. Developing a secure source of clean, renewable energy is what our country needs to combat climate change, strengthen our national security, and create good paying jobs. Our goal is to provide a predictable schedule to allow developers to effectively plan an investment strategy. Your comments today are valued. We are excited to be here today, and I hope you are too. With that, I will turn it over to our friends at Kearns and West. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kendall. We're going to start with some of the uh, logistics for the meeting. We're going to start with the logistics or the housekeeping for task force members, and then we'll transition into the technical um, minutia for the uh, attendees or members of the public. Um, for task force members, you all have the ability to control your own mute and unmute. You can do that on the lower left-hand corner of the Zoom task bar. Uh, we will ask that you queue for conversation during the open discussion periods using the raised hand feature. That is the raised hand icon along the task bar that is sometimes hidden within the participants tab itself. You can also, as task force members, share comments or questions using the chat function. Members of the public or attendees will not have the ability to use chat. We will be routing all of that conversation through the Q&A. I mentioned this before the meeting started, but we would encourage or invite you all as task force members to turn on your video when we enter into those open discussion periods so we can see everyone and have open discussion as freely as possible. Um, as task force members, you're also able to control the view within the meeting by clicking the little uh, icon in the top right corner where it says view and selecting a different 
uh, option. If you as task force members en encounter any technical issues, you can also email Eunice at ely at kernswest.com or you can use the chat function to get a hold of us and we can help um, work through any technical issues that you might be encountering. For those members of the public who joined us at 9 a.m. Central, a couple of items for you as well. You can use the Q&A function to address any technical issues that you encounter. I, I mentioned this at the outset of the meeting, but you will be muted throughout the task force meeting. Uh, expected at noon central, we will move into an, um, a public input opportunity where you will be provided the opportunity to raise your hand and unmute yourself to offer input or feedback to the task force itself. There will not be a chat function available to you throughout the course of the conversation. I, I would note that the public input opportunity is slated for noon central time, um, but that time is tentative. If we are moving ahead of schedule, we will do the public uh, input opportunity ahead of schedule as well. So those times are all uh, tentative. Again, if you encounter any technical issues throughout the course of the meeting, encourage you to email my colleague Eunice at ely at kernswest.com. To move now into another note that this meeting is um, being recorded. A recording will be made available and posted to BOEM's website uh, following the meeting, along with uh, the presentations that are being shared today. I also want to take a moment to talk through what our objectives are for today's conversation. Consistent with the rest of these intergovernmental task force meetings, uh, the overarching goal is to facilitate coordination between task force members regarding renewable energy leasing in the Gulf of Mexico. For this meeting, we're going to focus on in-depth discussion of the proposed a sale notice or PSN, you'll hear that acronym throughout the course of today's conversation. And um, we also wanna provide an opportunity for public input on the topics being considered by the task force. Again, that's at noon, but may run ahead of schedule. The agenda is structured in the, the following format. We're gonna have a series of presentations on the proposed sale notice. After those presentations, the task force will engage in open discussion We'll take a short break, and then we'll, we'll hear updates from the non-BOEM members of the task force. So that's tribal members, federal members, state and local members will be provided an opportunity to share updates. And then again, we'll have an open discussion after those updates. Once all of the task force members have provided their updates, we've had the discussion, we will adjourn the meeting. We're assuming that that will happen around 11.55 a.m. And then at 12 p.m. or noon central, we will open up for a public input opportunity. That is uh, your opportunity as participants to raise your hand and share feedback with the task force members. Um, and you'll get somewhere between one to three minutes to do so, depending on the number of folks who are looking to weigh in on the process. Um, I'm going to go through introductions or cover who we have on the call today as task force members. I'm not going to read all of these out because there are literally hundreds of them, but um, I will give a, a couple of minutes on each slide for you all uh, to take in who we have. We're going to start with the BOEM conveners. These are the members within the BOEM organization who are officially helping to support or manage the calls today. Many of the people who you uh, see or hear from on today's call are also reflected in this list. Along with BOEM, I want to recognize the elected officials and representatives who are members of our task force, as well as the tribal nations who are participants in the task force. The states we have Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas, with many of their agencies represented as well. And local governments. And finally, we have the federal agencies who are also represented on this task force. And I know we sped through that pretty quickly, but a roster of the task force members is available on the BOEM website 
Eunice just dropped that into the chat um, for folks to see. You're able to access that and look at the detailed um, notes about who is participating in today's call as members of the task force. That's why we were pretty brief about those topics. I want to very, very briefly cover the meeting process or guidelines. These are the ground rules for today's conversations. We would just ask that everyone, task force members and members of the public, participate respectfully. I will manage the queue and encourage folks to use the raise hand function at the appropriate times. Um, if you do come off mute and participate in the conversation, please use your full name and affiliation just for tracking purposes. For task force members who have the ability to manage their mute and unmute, please just remain unmuted until it's your time to speak to minimize uh, background noise. I did also want to make note um, in case there are members of the media on the line, as a reminder, these meetings are being held to provide an opportunity for discussion in that spirit. And please consider the information from task force members and members of the public not for attribution unless the person speaking gives permission to be quoted. If you are a member of the media and you want to interview a BOEM staffer, you can contact John Philistrat by email at John dot philistrat at boehm.gov or by phone at 504-284-8605 and Eunice should be dropping that information into the chat so you don't have to remember that phone number um, from memory. We're going to move from the top level matter into the presentations themselves. Um, we're going to have a session now on presentations from BOEM. So we have five total presentations from BOEM. After those presentations, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A from the task force members and open discussion from the task force members. So if you are a task force member, we would ask that you write down and hold all of your remarks or feedback to BOEM until after those five um, presentations and then I'll signal to you that it's the appropriate time to raise your hand and get into those. I will come off mute and introduce each of the present, uh, presenters from BOEM in turn. We actually have four presenters presenting five presentations. We'll chat about that as we get there. But we're going to start with a presentation from Renee Bigner and Wright Frank. Renee will be presenting on both um, Renee and Wright. Their presentation is on the proposed sale notice for the Gulf of Mexico. So Renee, if you're on camera, we'll get you spotlit and then you should have control of your slides to move forward in the presentation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Renee Bigner. I am a program analyst in the Gulf of Mexico region of BOEM, and I am the project coordinator for the Gulf of Mexico Wind 2. Today, we are going to go over the proposed sale notice that was published on March 21st. Our agenda includes the lease sale process and background, then NEPA analysis, consultation and coastal management zone management act, the potential lease specific terms, conditions, and stipulations, and the auction format and bidding credits. We're gonna start with the leasing and development process, which is broken down into four stages, the planning and analysis, leasing, site assessment, and construction and operations. We are currently in the planning and analysis stage. So we will take a closer look at that. And you can see that we're in the leasing document development stage. Like I have said, we published our proposed sale notice on March 21st, and we are in the 60-day public comment period. Next steps would include a final sale notice and an auction. So looking back to how we got here, for Gulf of Mexico Win 1, we partnered with INCOS, and with their marine spatial planning model, we were able to deconflict 14 wind energy areas. Area B was removed due to DOD conflicts, and for a go and win one, the wind injury areas I and M were advanced forward. This left 11 options to work with for Gulf of Mexico win two. It is important to note that even though two leases did not receive bids in Gulf of Mexico win one, they still remained a final WIA and could be considered or can be considered for future sales. Boehm then socialized those 11 WIAs and through stakeholder engagement, decided to move forward with five final WIAs for Gulf of Mexico Win 2. 
These were published on October 27th of 2023 and included options J, K, L, N, and I moving forward. Then again, through our partnership with INCOS, we utilized our precision siting modeling and went back with our stakeholder engagement that we had already done to find the most conflicted areas to move forward with as leases. These following four leases that are proposed in this sale notice are lease G7, G37962, G37963, G37964, and G37965. Taking a closer look at these, G37962 is in WIA I and is in the northern part of that and is 102,480 acres. 37963 is in the lower part of WIA I and is 96,786 acres. Lease G37964 is in WIA J. And lease 37965 is in WIA K, is 102,544 acres and is an equal distance from the coast of Louisiana and Texas. Altogether, these leases give us a total acreage of 410,040 acres and a power production of 13 million megawatts. The input we're requesting from stakeholders in our PSN are on the delineation, number, size, orientation, and location of the lease areas offered, benefits to underserved communities, bidding credits, including the workforce training and supply chain development, and the Fishing Compensatory Mitigation Fund. Tribal nations, ocean users, underserved communities, agencies, and other stakeholder engagement and reporting, and prescribed layouts. I'm going to pass it over to Michelle for NEPA. Michelle, if your camera's on, we should be able to spotlight you. And then you'll be able to present. I will note for the group that <laughs> Michelle is actually doing two uh, consecutive presentations. So Michelle will do a presentation on the National Environmental um, uh, Policy Act and then another presentation on the Coastal Zone Management Act, one after the other. So Michelle, I won't reintroduce you between the two <laughs> presentations. So over to you for the, the two back-to-backs. Thank you very much, Kyle. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. As Kyle said, my name is Michelle Nannan, and I'm the NEPA coordinator for the Offshore Wind 2 sale. BOEM conducted a Programmatic Environmental Assessment, or EA, for the Gulf of Mexico call area prior to the Offshore Wind Sale 1. BOEM then revisited that analysis conducted in the EA and verified that the conclusions were still valid for the offshore wind two lease sale in a determination of NEPA adequacy or DNA. And that DNA will be filed in the administrative record for the offshore wind two lease sale. For the environmental assessment, the analysis only covers the impacts of issuing leases and the associated site assessment and site characterization activities, which includes the installation of meteorological buoys, vessel trips, and geological and biological surveys. The analysis does not include specific project layouts, cable routes for specific projects, visual impacts of a project, or wind energy area identification. Analysis of specific projects is covered later in the process, after a lease is obtained and a project plan is submitted. And at that point, there are additional opportunities for engagement and consultation. The approach for this EA differs from those that were done in the Atlantic. We analyzed the call area rather than the wind energy areas. And the call area is outlined in red in the picture on the right of the slide. Analyzing the call area allows for greater flexibility for future identification of wind energy areas, and it provides NEPA coverage for non-competitive and research leases proposed in that call area. 
This approach is more in line with stakeholders in the Gulf of Mexico region who are familiar with the regional NEPA analysis. And it's a similar approach to the conventional energy NEPA that we do in the Gulf region in that the analysis is for more than one lease issuance. There's flexibility for the identification of several wind energy areas and lease areas over time. And it allows for up to 18 leases to be covered in the analysis. This EA is a programmatic assessment in that it may be used for more than one lease issuance. And that's why we can use it for this sale as well. We analyzed up to 18 leases in the call area. And that number was based on the number of leases based on the estimate of a foreseeable future activities based on historical trends in an emerging renewable energy program on the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf or OCS. The EA analyzes impacts of a single OCS wind energy lease issuance and the issuance of up to 18 OCS wind energy leases. And it includes the analysis of no more than six to eight leases per sale, which is similar to what was occurring in the Atlantic at the time of the EA. The EA concluded in a finding of no significant impact or FONSI. And that FONSI is available on the BOEM website at the link on this slide. The EA is also available on the BOEM website. And the determination of NEPA adequacy indicated that the conclusions of the EA are still valid and applicable for the offshore two wind lease sale. And now for the Coastal Zone Management Act. BOEM must comply with federal consistency regulations under the Coastal Zone Management Act, or CZMA, for the sale. BOEM has prepared consistency determinations, or CDs, for leases proposed in the proposed sale notice for the sale. The programmatic EA that we just discussed supports the evaluation contained within the CD, and the CD was sent to Louisiana and Texas Coastal Management Programs, or CMPs, in April of 2024, which began the federal consistency review process. The 60-day review period for Louisiana and Texas is scheduled to conclude in June of 2024. At that point, Louisiana and Texas CMPs could provide concurrence or objection to BOEM CDs, or BOEM could presume concurrence if a response is not provided by the end of the review period. And Louisiana and Texas CMPs may request a 15-day extension, and at that point, BOEM must grant that extension under CZMA. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll pass this on to the next presenter. Thanks, Michelle. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Next up will be Aditi Madkar. Aditi will be presenting on potential lease specific terms, conditions, and stipulations. Aditi, have we gotten your video on? And there you are. So it's over to you, and you should be able to control your own slides. Great. Thank you, Kyle. As Kyle mentioned, my name is Aditi Madkar, and I am an energy industry analyst with the Renewable Energy Policy Group. So potential lease specific terms, conditions, and stipulations. The following lease specific terms, conditions, and stipulations are proposed to be included in addendum C of the lease instrument. Those are site characterization, reporting, national security and military operations, standard operating conditions, project labor agreements, supply chain statement of goals, and two bidding credits, workforce training and or domestic supply chain development and the fisheries mit comp compensatory mitigation fund. And lastly, siting conditions. The reporting and enhanced engagement. A progress report is supposed to be submitted by a lessee every six months. They must include communication plans for fisheries, tribes and agencies. They must also include coordinated engagement between regional lessees. Project labor agreements. The lessee must make reasonable efforts to enter into a project labor agreement or PLA that covers the construction stage of any project proposed for the lease area. 
And lastly, the supply chain statement of goals. The lessee must submit a statement describing plans, including engagement with domestic suppliers for contributing to the creation of a robust and resilient US-based offshore wind supply chain. The minor edits were added to the lease instrument in the PSN to allow for hydrogen production. The two core areas were just, that were adjusted are easement and project description and the operations calculation. And I will pass it over to the next presenter. Thank you, DT. We're going to go to our final presentation from BOEM. That's Sarah Kaufman, Chief of the Economics Division. Sarah, it looks like you're ready to go and spotlit. So we can have you um, begin with your, your remarks. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Um, good morning. My name is Sarah Kaufman, and I lead BOEM's Economics Division. I will discuss the auction and bidding credits. The, the Gulf of Mexico Win 2 lease sale will be held as an ascending clock auction, and the lease is awarded to the highest bidder. Our auction is a multi full factor auction, meaning the winning bid can be made up of a combination of monetary and non monetary factors. The non monetary factors are bidding credits for commitments to financial investments in specific areas, which I will cover in the slides. Boom will begin the auction at an opening price for each lease area equivalent to $50 per acre. The bid price will increase each round until no more than one active bidder remains per lease area. Note that for this auction, we are using the new BOEM auction system. This auction system uh, follows a second price rule where the winning bidder will pay the highest bid amount at which there was competition. Before I discuss the details of the bidding credits, I wanted to highlight a methodological change that has been made on bidding credits between the first Gulf Wind lease sale and this current lease sale. And Gulf Wind 1 bidding credits were calculated as a percentage of the cash bid. But for this lease sale, Boehm has switched to the more intuitive calculation of bidding credits as a percentage of the winning bid. You will notice that the changes um, resulted in percentage changes with the bidding credits as a result of the methodological change. Because a cash bid is smaller than the winning bid, the bidding credit percentage was greater in the original calculation. You were taking a higher percentage of a smaller number. Now, for Gulf Wind 2, the percentages are slightly lower because they represent the percentage of the full value of the winning bid. You can see this in the example on the slide. In both cases, bidding credits under Bohm's bidding credit cap of 25% of the winning bid. So shown in the table under the Gulf Wind 1 calculation, we were doing 30% of the cash bid, and that resulted in an effective rate of 23% of the winning bid but the percentages for Gulf Wind 2 are slightly higher, representing 25% of the winning bid. I recognize that's confusing um, and, and some sort of math lesson for your day, but this is the way that we will plan to calculate bidding credits moving forward, and it's ultimately a more simple calculation. So now to what the bidding credits actually are. Bohm has proposed two bidding credits for this lease sale. Bidders may receive the bidding credit in exchange for their commitment to a monetary contribution to offshore wind programs or initiatives. Bidding credits are designed to advance BOEM's mandates under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. The first is a 17% bidding credit for an equal contribution to workforce or supply chain development to support the offshore wind industry. The second is an 8% bidding credit for an equal commitment to a fisheries compensatory mitigation fund. A little more on the workforce training and supply chain development credit. This credit is awarded with the commitment that the lessee will invest the amount of their credit in programs that will advance U.S. offshore wind energy training or supply chain development. Commitments to workforce training must result in better trained or larger domestic offshore wind workforce that would provide for more efficient operations via increasing the supply of fully trained personnel. Trained employees must be able to be hired by any lessee. For the supply chain development bidding credit, the investment must result in overall benefits to the U.S. offshore wind supply chain and either development of new or expanded capacity or improvements to the supply chain by reducing upfront capital or certification costs, including the building of facilities. Lessees are not permitted to retain an ownership interest in these supply chain efforts, but can purchase goods or services at market rates. This bidding credit is consistent with the OCS Lands Act mandate by ensuring operations are conducted safely with well-trained personnel. 
and in building the domestic supply chain, that there is expeditious and orderly development on the OCS. The second bidding credit is an 8% credit for a commitment to either start or contribute to an existing compensatory mitigation fund for commercial and for higher fisheries. This bidding credit recognizes OXLA's requirement to consider other uses of the sea, including fisheries. At a minimum, com compensation must address gear loss or damage and lost fishing income from the Gulf of Mexico wind lease areas. If the fund is determined to have excess funds, these funds can be used for engagement and select gear upgrades. The bidding credit and fund are designed to promote, provide certainty to fishery stakeholders that a perpetual fund will be available to mitigate impacts. With the bidding credits, lessees also commit to covering any damages associated with activities on the lease before construction begins and the establishment of the fund. So the bidders indicate their interest in the bidding credit after the final sale notice when they submit their bidder's financial form. With that form, they also submit a conceptual strategy to indicate the actions the lessee will take to allow BOEM to confirm compliance with the bidding credit. BOEM convenes an auction panel that reviews the conceptual strategies and determines whether to award the bidding credit in advance of the auction. Bidding credits are awarded on a pass-fail basis. This slide provides an example of the bidding credit. As a reminder, the bidding credit is calculated as the percentage of the winning bid. The cash bid plus the bidding credit amount sum to make the winning bid. If the winning bid in the lease area is 10 million and the lessee received both bidding credits for a total of a 25% bidding credit, the lessee would pay seven and a half million to honor and commit to spending 1.7 million on workforce training, supply chain development, and 800,000 to the fisheries compensatory mitigation fund. All right, Kyle. Thanks, Sarah. And we'll ask you to stay on camera and bring back all of the um, BOEM presenters who just shared to come on camera too. We're moving into our first of two periods of open task force discussion and comment. I want to cover a little bit about um, what is meant um, by this section. Really, task force members, those of you who are on the line, this is an opportunity for you all to provide feedback to BOEM about what was just presented or to ask clarifying questions. Um, in terms of logistics or structure as task force members, we'd ask that you raise your hand to get into the queue to ask those questions or to provide those comments along the way. And then I will call on you and ask you to come off mute to share that feedback. And then conversation may just naturally occur after that. And we're, we're okay with that happening. Um, similarly, we'd ask that uh, task force members, if you feel comfortable, um, turn on your camera so that we can see you, especially if you are going to engage in the conversation itself. Uh, if you do uh, participate, as a reminder, we'd ask that you share your full name and affiliation so that we can track it for notes and we know who's participating in the discussion. Um, if you can't navigate to the mute unmute button, if you're having technical difficulties or if you're just not comfortable coming off mute to share your feedback, you can also use the chat function. And I will do um, my best to monitor the chat function and bring anything that's shared in text through that function itself. For, for members of the public, we've seen a couple of uh, topical questions pop up in the Q&A um, pod. I just want to remind everyone that this is a moment for task force to task force member discussion. And then we're going to hold all of the public comments and questions until the public input opportunity at the end of the meeting. So we've seen those come in. We're going to hold them until the end of the meeting unless um, any of the um, BOEM presenters want to weigh in or address those questions immediately. We'll, we'll hold them until then. So with that, I'd, I'd actually ask that we stop sharing the slides so that we can see a, a larger cross-section of the, the panelists. And I see that we have a, a hand up from Camille. Camille, if you could go ahead and share your name and affiliation and then share your feedback. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Camille Manning Broom, the president and CEO of the Center for Planning Excellence. And um, thank you all to um, BOA members and the, the feds in the state for all the work that you have done. We are uh, real excited about the opportunities with, with these lease sales. Um, my question is in the PS, the PSN has the same bidding credits as the last auction with workforce supply chain and fisheries. 
And I'd like to know what the rationale in keeping these same bidding credits um, are. Um, the state is leading a comprehensive offshore wind roadmap uh, to really uh, work with work with champions and communities across the state to understand what 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 benefits would look like, what impacts would look like. Um, and I'm curious as other bidding credits have had more flexible um, language and tools such as community benefit agreements so that, um, we can ensure that that 25% is going towards uh, the, the, the real needs of the community in terms of impacts. Go ahead, Sarah. I saw that you came off mute. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Take the take first take time. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, Camille. Thanks. For that. um, that's, that's some really great feedback. Um, in, in determining the bidding credits, a lot goes into that dis discussion and decision in advance of a, a proposed sale notice. And of course, we definitely welcome this feedback and these comments during the comment period that we can consider for the final sale notice. Um, you know, as I mentioned, one of the things, the main things we look at is consistency with our Outer Continental, Continental Shelf Lands Act mandates. And as far as what is, what are what are our mandates there and how do the bidding credits advance them? Um, so that's where we have identified this fisheries mitigation fund and the offshore wind supply chain and develop, um, training development are, are two that are, are in need. Um, they're in need for the area, they're in need to develop the offshore wind industry. And so that's why those have been um, those have been included here. We've included CBAs and in other lease sales. Um, however, that was determined not to be included in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the CBA, CBA, what is what we're kind of allowed to do under the requirements of, of OXLA and what would ultimately be incorporated in the lease is a very limited community benefit agreement, um, specifically for impacts associated with the project. And we found in other examples that um, lessees are are engaging in their own community benefit agreement. And often these can have these can have much more far reaching benefits. Um, than what, what is allowed to be included as part of a bidding credit. Um, and so that is something that we certainly have seen and we're encouraged by that and, um, you know, would, would look forward to, you know, we would expect that lessees would continue to do that in future projects. Camille, any follow-up or additional comments you'd like to make? Yeah, I, I would like to um, understand how, how, how that was, is it written somewhere that it needs to be that? It, it really does um, limit the state's ability um, to have more flexibility with the wind developer. Um, and, and, and we've got the examples from Virginia and the Carolinas on the CBA, um, on the, the conservation credits, the California examples of the CBAs. And so um, I would appreciate, and perhaps it's a follow-up call and I'd be happy to um, make sure that our Department of Energy and Natural Resources is, is part of that conversation too, because I just want to make sure um, that we're sending the right signals to the market and that resources are putting in are being put into the right buckets, um, given Louisiana's ecology and needs. Uh, so that, so thanks thanks for your response, but that that is um, still a question to me. Right, we're, we're happy to have follow up discussions. That would that would be great. Thanks. And Camille, we really appreciate you being the first mover and being brave to come off mute, come on camera and to, to engage in the discussion. So I'll, I'll take a little time here to see if there are others on the task force who would like to participate or ask follow up. Matthew Fullerton, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, hi everybody, can you all see me okay? We can, can see and hear. Yeah, hi. Uh, so I'm Matt Fullerton. I'm with the Fish and Wildlife Services Southwest Regional Office. I'm the Renewable Energy Coordinator. Um, and I had a question that pertains to the uh, the wind energy areas. And so it was mentioned there's five final wind energy areas that were, you know, parsed down from the original, I believe, 14, if that's correct. And so I guess my question is, like, I just wanted confirmation that the, the five uh, WIAs that exist are... I mean, are, the, are those are those solid from this point forward and pretty much only lease sales can happen within those designated air, five WIAs at this point? 
So the process, how it works is we will publish usually a draft WIA. Then from those draft WIAs, we go to a final WIA, which is a wind energy area. Then it is whittled down to a lease area. So right. the other ones that are in that 14 are considered still draft. We went straight to the final WIA okay. this time because we had already published those WIAs for Gulf of Mexico Win 1. They had not been used. But we did go through okay. and make sure that there was no new data within COS to make sure that nothing had changed before we moved those forward. Okay, so potentially in the future then, those draft WIAs could be come forward as final we is in the future they would have we would have to relook at the data again but they could potentially okay thank you to, to be con i'm sorry this is bridget do plan us from uh from boom uh, in order for them to be considered for an actual lease sale they would have to be final wind energy areas so anything that moves forward in the process from draft to final then it could move into a lease area thank you Matthew, any other follow-up or feedback that you'd like to, to share? Nope, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. Well, thank you. Maureen Calgren, we see that you have your hand up as well. If you need any help unmuting, just let us know. I think I got my video on, so you should be able to hear me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I work at the Office of Navigation Systems and Coast Guard Headquarters, and we run the marine planning um, uh, efforts for you know, coexistence on the OCS. My question is um, regarding the Fisheries Mitigation Fund, and I know it's been used in the Northeast, or maybe it's been used in a different way in the Northeast, but my question is, the, the mitigation fund that's being proposed for, for bidding credits or for use, um, is that, um, you mentioned that that fund would be used for potential gear replacement. Is that limited to fishing gear replacement or would that also include items um, for navigation safety such as radar upgrades? Yes, yes, thanks, thanks, Maureen, for that question. Um, so the, the priority of the fund is to compensate fisheries and for gear loss and damages um, from the area. You know, through the accounting of the firm if, or of the fund, if there's determined there is enough um, funds that can that would be able to cover that for the longevity of the leases, um, but also other funds there, you know, it is included in the lease that the fund could be used to offset the cost of gear and navigational aid upgrades and other transitions for operating within a wind farm. So I believe those would be um, included, but I would definitely encourage you to read the, um, to read what's in the lease. Um, that's what, what would be kind of ultimately what is required for the for the fund. And if you do not see something there, please reach out or you know certainly submit a comment on that. But the idea is that you could use those excess funds for navigational aid upgrades. Thanks so much, Sarah. And we do have a couple of questions that are coming in from members of the public via the Q&A um, pod. Great questions that we're going to get to at the public input opportunity, but we're going to hold um, for now so that we can continue conversation between task force members like David Carr, who I see has his hand up. So David, over to you. Hello, just trying to get my video on. Uh, um, wanted to just clarify one small area we have b bravo that one was taken off the table and it will not come back on the table is that correct that is correct that one was removed from consideration completely okay thank you very much you're welcome i'm not seeing other hands at this christine i was wrong christine please please go ahead Hi, uh, my name is Christine Willis. I'm with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Um, I just had a question about um, hydrogen was not included in the initial uh, first sale, and it was in this one. And um, I was wondering if there'd be more information or perhaps a webinar or technical training on the infrastructure required for hydrogen development. And so that was my question. Anyone from the BOEM team want to weigh in on? 
hydrogen there, or if there's a another member of the BOEM team who's on the line that that would like to to address that. Right, I see that you've yeah, just turned you. on your camera. We'll go ahead thanks and spotlight. For, thanks for asking about that. The, um, we we've heard in the past that hydrogen may be of interest uh, to our lessees. We've done a study on um, on hydrogen that that talks a little bit about the infrastructure that could be used, but really this is, um, we didn't want the least form to be a the what holds anything up. So our, our process allows uh, LSE to um, submit a construction operations plan proposing hydrogen facilities. Um, and we, uh, we didn't want the least form to be the reason why, you know, that was, we didn't want to be discouraging it um, in that way. So we made some conforming edits to allow its use. Um, that's really, we don't, at, at this point, it's it's very early to talk about what kinds of facilities would be proposed under that. Um, but we, you know, recognizing that it's a, that it's a technology that could be paired to create, with, with wind to create green hydrogen, we wanted to um, facilitate that use if it were if, if, if anyone's interested. We it, it's really not a, a mandate that that be used or or anything. It's just it um, enabling optionality on the on the these forms. Yeah, I guess just because of the potential effects, we would like to have some presentations on that since that is a new technology and we may not understand what the potential effects are to wildlife. So well. It, uh, you know, the, the construction operations plan is where we would find out what kind of technology was proposed and we would be doing a full environmental impact statement and consultations under ESA with the Fish and Wildlife Service on those kinds of issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Wright, for hopping on and helping to address that question. Uh, Andy Strelchek from NOAA, please go ahead with your comment or question. Yeah, thank you uh, for hosting the task force meeting. I have uh, several questions regarding the fisheries compensation fund. I guess the first question, given the uh, low amount for the first lease sale, right, the fisheries compensation fund isn't very large. Is that um, compensation fund intended to be over the course of the entire lease? Yes, the design of the fund is to be over the entire life of the lease. If there is, are not enough funds, you know, as, as Wright was just mentioning, the cap and the EIS process that happens um, later with the time of development, if it, you know, they will be, they will determine if additional funds are needed, those would be required at that time. Okay. And then um, obviously you've had one lease sale already. Gulf Wind 2 has multiple potential lease sales. Is the compensation fund specific to the lease site itself, or is this a cumulative fund that would essentially um, pool together funding from all of these lease sales and mitigate for impacts across the entire offshore wind portfolio? We don't require it one way or the other, um, but we have encouraged and we would expect that lessees to save on um, administrative costs would pool their funds. Um, and, and create essentially a regional fund, you know, that is not required, but that is what, you know, that is what we would probably expect to happen um, is that they would, they would pull the funds and then that would be, you know, those funds would be available for any lease with the idea that potentially in the future leases would be in more conflicted areas and have more impact that these funds would be available for those as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Andy, any other questions or comments? Others from the task force. We have a we have a big window here, so we've got plenty of time um, to incorporate any conversation that folks might want to have. So I will pause just to see if there are people trying to compose chats or create their their question. I'm glad I waited, uh, Laura. You have your hand up first, so we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Camille second. Good morning. Um, I was curious to that. I, I don't. I hope I didn't miss it, and not not asking a question I should already know the answer to. But um, what's the timeline from 
the end of this commenting period uh, on this on on these proposed lease sales areas, um, and when an actual auction would occur. So after the comment period, if we choose to move forward, then the final sale notice would be published. The final sale notice must be published a minimum of 30 days before a sale. Okay. So if the commenting period is ending in May. May 20th is the end of the comment period. Right. So sometime in late summer, potentially. Similar to last year, I, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah, okay. it's to say, yes. Right. Um, I mean, you know that we cannot make comments on that. It's it's okay. just a final sale notice. Sale is minimum of 30 days from a final sale. Notice. Okay. And then I don't know if at, at some point during um, this morning's meeting, if there's going to be any update about the um, lease sale that was bid on and where they are in the process and um, also, any information about um, biological data that's been collected in the Gulf, you know, we continue at Texas Parks and Wildlife to have serious concerns about the paucity of data related to the impacts that may occur to bats and birds uh, across the Gulf. And so I, I didn't, it wasn't clear if that was going to be covered in today's agenda. That will not be covered in today's agenda. Um, they are in the planning stage. And so that would be a whole different discussion and topic. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Any anything else on, on your end, Laura? Okay. And Camille, I had seen your hand pop up and then go back down. I didn't know if that was inadvertent or if you wanted to rejoin the, the conversation. Hi, yes, I, I lowered it once you acknowledged me. Um, thank you so much. As far as the percentage cap on the bidding credit, is that cap based on the current market? Um, I just like to, you know, know if there's any documentation on how that cap was determined and if it aligns with current market forces just for our own um, work that we're doing through the planning effort on understanding um, the market better. Sure, that's that's a great question. Um, when we, we talk we talk a lot about um, so. You know, ultimately the bidding cap, the bidding credit cap, is is determined by BOEM. Um, you can look. We have some we have some papers by our auction contractor, some um, academic style papers about auction format and details of credits, multiple factor auctions that are available on the website and the lease and grant page. Um, that kind of discusses, you know, that bidding credits. The idea behind the twenty five percent cap kind of has two purposes. One is to ensure that you're not affecting the competitiveness of the auction. If the bidding credit cap were too, if the bidding credits were too high, you could ultimately be picking the winners and losers of the auction based on the bidding credit amount. And so that is one reason why it is it is set at twenty five percent. The other thing that Boom has determined is that the twenty five percent cap allows for the appropriate. Um, kind of balancing between our mandate to provide a fair return to the taxpayer, to the federal treasury, and then also our ability and requirements through OXLA to address these other factors that are required there. We call them the 8P factors. Um, so we we recognize that that is a, is a balance and a, and a delicate balance, but you know, without any official revenue sharing or anything from, from Congress, the funds from OCS are to go, you know, are to provide a fair return back to the taxpayer and go to the treasury. Um, so we balance that with these other factors and the 75-25% split is where BOEM has, has landed as far as how those bidding credits should work. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Camille. I'll pause again to see if anyone else from the task force has follow-up questions or feedback. The BOEM folks who we have on the line, is there any additional context or information you want to share beyond what you presented when when you were addressing those questions that just came up? Anything that came to mind afterwards? Okay. We'll do one last check to see if there are other task force members who want to enter the discussion and, and you have another cut at this. So we're going to hear from all of the updates from all of the other task force members will re-enter open discussion. So this is not your only go um, or opportunity to, to be part of the discussion.
All right. Um, I'm going to make an agenda change or propose an agenda change. Um, we are um, just over 30 minutes ahead of schedule in our time. We had originally planned for a 15 minute break, 10 to 15 minute break between the BOEM updates and the remainder of the task force updates. I'm actually going to propose that we eliminate that break and take a longer break between the next set of updates and the public input opportunity, um, just because we don't need a break after just one hour. So we'll do the next set of updates. We have about um, 45 minutes set aside for this conversation, and then we'll take a longer break after we come back from the next set of updates from the remainder of the task force participants. So we're going to start the, the conversation there with updates from tribal members. I don't um, know if there are any updates from tribal members. If there is um, anyone representing the tribes on the task force in attendance that would like to share any remarks, we're going to give you the microphone. You can raise your hand to let me know that you'd like to weigh in in this section. And if not, we'll, we'll move on to the next series of updates. So I'll pause momentarily to see if there are any tribal members who would like to share updates. Okay. Moving forward, we're going to start with some um, federal updates. These are formal presentations that had been suggested ahead of time. There will be other opportunities for other agencies to share brief updates. Um, at the end of this section. So we're going to move into two formal presentations from um, BOEM's federal partners here. We're going to start with a presentation from Lieutenant Commander Rachel Stryker from the Coast Guard, um, who has a couple of slides to present now. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Stryker, if you're on and able to get your video turned on, we'll get you spotlit, and then I will control the slides on your behalf. I believe I, I needed to control those. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Lieutenant Commander Rachel Stryker. I am with uh, District 8 with Coast Guard um, handling the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide, please. This is just a general overview of what the fairways, we are doing a port access route study for the Gulf of Mexico, the areas into Houston, Sabine and Calcasieu which includes the ports of Port of Lake Charles as well. The current studies were last, the major, last major study was completed in um, the late 1970, early 1980, um, was a general US fairways for the entire, into all major ports. There were no major changes to Gulf fairways um, though there was a tra traffic separation scheme for Houston and Galveston recommended, which was adopted in 1982. And there were recommendations for anchorages for Sabine Pass outside of the Port Arthur Beaumont area and for Calcasieu Pass outside of the Lake Charles area. These have not, uh, these have not been approved as of yet. In 1984 and 1985, there was a request to, do, to look at the fairways at Held Bank, approximately 31 miles offshore Galveston, and into the Louisiana offshore oil port near Port Fouchon and New Orleans. Recommendations came with a new fairway around Held Bank, but no changes to the Louisiana offshore oil port fairways. One additional change did happen in 1989 when the traffic separation scheme for Houston Galveston was updated. I'll now get into the current study and on the next page. On March 1st, 2023, the Coast Guard District 8 proposed in the Federal Register notice that we would do a port access route study for the approaches to Houston Galveston, to Sabine Pass, and to Calcasieu Pass. The chart there shows the outline of, wh of what areas we are looking for. It was open for comment until 17 May of 2023. During that time, we received seven comments, mostly from industry personnel, both um, clean water, uh, mariners, and other personnel using the waterways and the fairways. 
the big concern came from where the energy is going to be. Um, would the Mariners have enough area to continue maintaining their fairways? Um, our biggest concerns looking into this was the entry into the ports within the within the probably 10 to 20 mile range outside uh, lightering areas where very large ships that may not be able to go into the ports are um, have their oil transferred while two vessels are transiting at the same time at the same speed and so that the oil could be pu pulled off very large crude carriers and into smaller carriers that can go into and out of the ports and the width of the fairways. We also uh, sent a letter to federal agencies and, and state agencies for their comments. We did not receive any comments from any federal or state agency. We are approximately 80% complete and are mainly working on um, trying getting the heat maps of vessel traffic over the last several years so that we can determine if there are any changes that would be recommended to the fairways. Once we do have this completed, we are talking about doing a general Gulf-wide port access route study to include everything from Brownsville to Key West combining both districts seven and eight for the Gulf of Mexico. And that's all I have. So I will pass it back to Kyle. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander Stryker. Um, I just wanna go through a couple of housekeeping items here too. Just like in the last section, as task force members, we ask that you're writing down your questions or follow-up discussion items until after all of these presentations, and then we'll take them in one lump sum. Um, again, as members of the public, um, this is a, a closed conversation between task force members. You can still pose your questions or write down your comments. We'll just discuss those during the formal public input opportunity at the close of the conversation. I know we've had um, about five or six questions pop up in Q&A. We've been tracking all of those and we'll work to address those during the public input opportunity. We just won't do it as part of this open discussion in this moment, just after we convene the task force meeting itself. So just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page about that before handing it over to Andy Strelchek from NOAA to um, provide your task force updates. Andy, to you. Thanks, Kyle. And once again, appreciate the opportunity to speak to the task force. Uh, Andy Strelchek, I'm the regional administrator for NOAA Fisheries out of St. Petersburg, Florida. Um, First slide here just talks about kind of an outline for my presentation. I will try to keep it brief, but we want to talk about some of the successes we've had as well as some of the challenges. But I do want to acknowledge that it uh, has been a very productive dialogue, working relationship with BOEM, with the states, with other stakeholders, and uh, appreciate the ongoing collaboration as we work through uh, development of offshore wind energy uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide. So starting off with some of the successes, as it's already been acknowledged, um, BOEM collaborated with NOAA Fisheries, NCOS, others to develop a marine spatial planning model. We view this as a resounding success that's helped us identify these uh, wind energy areas and support, obviously, uh, deconflicting uh, ocean uses with stakeholders. That model is now being expanded and used nationwide in other regions of the United States. Um, and it's helped obviously reduce conflicts with affected fisheries, as well as avoid uh, uh, pushing offshore wind energy into uh, proposed critical habitat for the rice as well, which is one of our most highly endangered whales um, that we conserve and protect. Um, in addition, we view successes about the bidding credits and appreciate you answering my questions about the fisheries con uh, compensation fund. And we've had an ongoing uh, effort with BOEM uh, to work on a survey mitigation strategy and uh, really look forward to obviously continuing that coordination to finalize that survey mitigation strategy going forward. And I'll touch upon that uh, in a, a following slide. 
And then lastly, just some integration uh, and participation in various NIMPS research planning efforts. So all those are positives and we need to continue the collaboration and coordination going forward. That's gonna be paramount in our view in order to make this successful. Next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we uh, run a number of scientific surveys in the Gulf of Mexico. We did have a layer within the marine spatial planning that showed you know, the potential for impacts of those surveys. But there's four areas of specific impacts related to uh, our vessels and aircraft that could be excluded from accessing specific areas of the Gulf to increase vessel transit time, as well as impacts to the statistical designs in which we utilize for sampling um, in the Gulf and uh, potential alteration of habitat types, which are obviously used by our uh, trust resources. Um, so we uh, obviously want to uh, mitigate those effects and ultimately avoid uh, significant disruptions to the design uh, of our surveys that then will increase uncertainty in the assessments we do for our various marine species. And so, as I've mentioned, we are continuing to collaborate and work with BOEM on that survey mitigation strategy and uh, appreciate the comments and input we've received so far. Next slide. Um, so it was noted earlier about green hydrogen and um, the extension of the lease scope. Um, we uh, do have some concerns in this area. Uh, first, that it was not uh, included in the marine spatial planning effort previously. Um, and then uh, more significantly, right, there's concerns about the impacts of green hydrogen uh, operations on uh, the volume of water that it might use, as well as raising impingement concerns for fish, eggs, and larvae, obviously species that we manage in federal waters and the potential impact, negative impacts they could have for those stocks. And so um, we did want to acknowledge, obviously, uh, those potential impacts up front and uh, understand, obviously, uh, the operations of green hydrogen more fully going forward. Um, also, you know, kind of the trade-off here in terms of the goals of the administration, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish to get to um, the megawatt hours for generating um, offshore wind energy and how that may be displaced by um, other um, uh, fuel generation. And so um, lastly, you know, want to continue to move forward with future marine spatial planning that informs all additional lease opportunities and consider the full speed of those activities with those marine spatial planning efforts going forward if in fact there's a Gulf Wind 3. Next slide. Um, so I won't read all this in detail, but you know, just to emphasize stakeholder engagement is key and paramount um, to the success of this process. And we've certainly uh, appreciated BOEM coming to Fishery Management Council meetings and engaging a lot of our stakeholders directly. Um, we've heard a lot of positive uh, input from uh, key industries um, about uh, the efforts that BOEM has made to coordinate and communicate with them. Uh, NOAA Fisheries also has an environmental equity environmental justice um, strategy, and we're actually just now finalizing our regional implementation strategy. And so uh, on our view, it's key to be inclusive of all these groups and uh, really do the legwork up front in terms of understanding the impacts uh, to uh, those communities uh, that could be affected uh, by offshore wind energy, uh, as well as benefit from offshore wind energy. Uh, and then as I commented earlier about the bidding credit credit process, you know, one of the things that's really unclear to us is the, you know, the level of the bidding credit, and you've explained it well in terms of the change from Gulf Wind 1 to Gulf Wind 2, but uh, what that amount really means for compensating for potential impacts to commercial and recreational fisheries. And so I was glad to hear that um, that could be addressed more fully at the COP stage um, once that moves forward. Um, so next slide. Um, and so the last points I want to emphasize really is the cumulative impact. And I, I touched upon this with my um, fisheries compensation question, but obviously as offshore wind grows in the region, uh, the process of approving uh, lease operations, uh, you know, will expand out and, and we're doing it right now on a project by project basis, but 
obviously we're dealing with a large marine ecosystem and the effects are going to be cumulative across the whole suite of projects that are being considered uh, and so you know in our view right now the existing common approval process does not readily support those cumulative impacts and so how do we set up uh, and better address consideration of cumulative impacts going forward and so the next slide will kind of touch upon some of the re recommendations and suggestions we have next slide um, and so we've talked some with BOEM about the uh, value of preparing a programmatic Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation. Um, that programmatic consultation can uh, address the depth and breadth of construction operation and decommissioning activities. And in our view, would assist both agencies uh, in terms of improving the efficiencies in the permitting process, as well as allowing us to consider those cumulative impacts of uh, wind energy, in particular protected species, but all of the marine species we conserve and manage. And then um, regional monitoring and adaptive management, right? I talked about the challenges with obviously uh, the impacts to our survey enterprise, but developing not just a lease by lease site specific monitoring program, but something that could be done region wide um, that uh, obviously benefits uh, that Western Gulf of Mexico in terms of how we uh, monitor and adaptively management uh, in our view is really key. And so uh, in our view, that will help then to proactively uh, manage and address and mitigate uh, effects of wind energy going forward and help to minimize potential unforeseen impacts. So we just wanted to emphasize like we really want to learn before doing and not after doing and that uh, these uh, challenges do present opportunities for us to adapt and better prepare for the future. So uh, with that, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Andy, and thank you also to Lieutenant Commander Stryker. We're going to bring you back on and have you turn on your cameras for the open discussion should anyone have follow-up just here in a minute. So um, you can keep it on or you can come back here in a couple of minutes. We did want to provide a platform for other task force members to share any updates they might have as well. So these would be informal updates, um, not pre-established presentations. We'll start with the state task force members. So is there anyone from Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, or Texas who would like to provide a status update or, or general remarks on behalf of um, your delegation? So Chris, you came off mute. Uh, I came off mute just to tell you I appreciate the opportunity, but I don't have an update for Alabama. I'm more just uh, listening and seeing where we're on the process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. No obligation to, to, to provide an update, but we just wanted to give um, folks the space should they have some informal remarks to make. Okay. I will do the same for any of our local task force members. Anyone um, from the, the group of local task force members that wants to weigh in? Or any of the other federal agencies beyond Coast Guard or NOAA Fisheries who just provided their, their updates? Joshua from NOAA, I see your hand up. You should be able to unmute yourself. I'll prompt that on your, there we go. Please. Yeah, hey, hey everyone. I, I just wanted to take the opportunity. This is my, uh, this is my first one of these meetings um, as I have um, just wanted to introduce myself. I'm the new Marine Planning Coordinator for the Gulf of Mexico for NCOS. Um, obviously, as you all know, we are supporting BOEM heavily, and, and as Andy just talked about on the modeling side, and I just wanted to take the opportunity to, to introduce myself and say that it's um, it's nice to be a part of this moving forward. Thank you for the uh, introduction, Joshua, and appreciate you joining us today. Absolutely. Anything else from the federal family? Randy? Hey, yeah, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. So just a quick update from Fish and Wildlife Service, Randy Wilson, Migratory Bird Program. 
And so just a quick update that we continue as an agency to pr promote and uh, implement monitoring programs to try to better the decision-making process. So we currently are investing in a vulnerability assessment, a risk assessment framework, as well as additional um, monitoring programs to kind of better understand bird movements uh, in and within the Gulf of Mexico. So hopefully we're in a better position to inform decision-making as things move forward. So just a quick update and sorry for the nasally um, sinus season here in the South. And so you just live with it. So. All of us, all of us are working through our allergy issues at this time of year, Randy. Appreciate you joining and sharing an update. Any others from the, the federal family? Okay, so Andy and Lieutenant Commander Stryker would ask that you come back on video um, to provide a, an opportunity for task force members to um, ask any follow-up or clarifying questions of the two of you regarding your presentations. And then if there's any other topics that the task force members would like to discuss as a task force, we're gonna, we're gonna cover that in this section here. So any topics not yet discussed that you wanna be sure to work through can be covered at this time as well. Again, raise hand function to let me know that you'd like to engage. If you can't find it, just come off mute and begin your remarks. I'm sharing your name and affiliation so that everyone is aware of who you are. I'll pause. Eunice is putting in some of those instructions into chat too. And again, for members of the public, you may be putting some comments or questions into Q&A. We're not going to be able to get to it in this um, section, but we'll have an opportunity to discuss in more detail during the public input opportunity that follows this conversation. Andy and Lieutenant Commander Stryker, it sounds like your presentations were great. No follow-up questions so far. Okay. With that the case, we're going to transition into the next steps and closing items on the task force meeting before the public input opportunity conversation. Um, we want to provide an overview of some of the immediate next steps where the conversation goes from here. Um, and then we will adjourn and come back for the public input opportunity. So I think I'm going to be turning it over to Renee to cover the next slide, which is what activities BOEM has up over the next few months and the timing associated with those. And then we'll move into the, the formal conclusion of the task force meeting itself. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so future actions and the next steps would include, um, we will be at IPF next week. There's a group of us that will be there. So, you know, look for us and, you know, we're happy to answer any questions that we can. You can prov provide fi formal comments on the PSN at regulations.gov. Our docket number is BOEM 2024 -0017. And those must be submitted on or before 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on May 20th, 2024. Next steps would include after that, the final sale notice and a proposed lease auction. Okay. It sounded like we might have a couple of folks who were gonna do the, the final remarks. The time on this slide is not correct. We're gonna be adjusting that time here momentarily after we go through um, the next steps. I'm gonna be handing it over to either Bridget or Laura to do the, the formal close and adjournment of the conversation, but we're gonna take a, um, call it a, a 15 minute break until uh, 10.35 central time where we will begin our um, public input opportunity. So we'll update this slide here momentarily to reflect 10.35 a.m. Central Time for the public input opportunity. And then I'm going to hand it to uh, Bridget or Laura if either of you want to um, provide the formal closing remarks and adjourn our meeting before the public input opportunity. Sure, I can take that. I'm not sure. Um, if Laura's on or not, but um, I can go ahead and take that. 
Uh, my name is Bridget Duplantis. I'm the chief of our leasing and financial responsibility section here at BOEM in our Gulf of Mexico region. And we just wanted to take this chance to say thank you so much for joining our fifth uh, task force meeting. Uh, we're really excited uh, to have you guys here and thank you for all of your valuable input. Um, just a reminder to uh, provide any formal comments like Renee said on regulations.gov and that all of our presentations will be available on the BOEM website at BOEM.gov. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Bridget. And we're going to take, a, as a reminder, we're going to take a break until 10.35 a.m. Central when we'll shift over to the public input opportunity. That will be the opportunity for members of the public to come off mute, to ask their questions, or to provide um, input um, to the process. Thank you, everyone. Okay, it is now time to begin our public input opportunity. This is an hour of time set aside for general comment from the public or input from the public itself. We'll go through some of the mechanics of how that process will occur here in a moment. Um, the general guidelines for this conversation to join the queue, we're going to ask that members of the public use the raise hand function that will become available at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will call on people in the order in which I see them. Um, you may also share your public input via the Q&A box, um, which should also be available at the bottom of the screen. I will also bring into the conversation those comments and questions that we received already in the meeting. So if you asked a question or provided a, a piece of input already, um, do not worry, we'll, we'll work to get that um, integrated into the conversation as we um, progress through this process. I also want to note that this is not a formal public uh, comment opportunity. Formal comments on the proposed sale notice should be provided through regulations.gov via the docket number BOEM-2024-0019. And those comments need to be submitted on or before 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on May 20th, 2024. So just over a month from now. So this is not an opportunity to provide those formal comments. They will not go into the formal um, federal register. It's an opportunity to share feedback with the task force members and with the BOEM staff who are on the call today. If you do want to leave a formal public comment, do so through the regulations.gov website. Uh, Eunice just dropped that information um, into chat itself. Um, we're going to, again, um, as a reminder, ask you to use the raise hand function to get into the queue. Um, we will call on you in the order in which that queue is established. We're going to have somewhere between one to three minutes set aside for each of the folks who participate in that conversation. Um, we're going to um, turn on the raise hand function here in a moment, and we'll ask anyone who's interested in participating in that portion to please raise your hand at that time. And I will use that to get a sense of just how many people want to participate. And then we'll fine tune somewhere between one to three minutes for those comments. If we have a lot of people who want to participate in the public input opportunity, we'll have less time available for everyone. If it's a very limited number of folks who would like to provide input, then they'll have more time to do so. We will cap our time at, at one hour, so we're hoping to provide as much time um, as possible for public input, and then we'll end um, that public input opportunity at 11.40 a.m. Um, Central Time. I'm going to just make sure that we have um, everything lined up here. Our tech is good to go. So Eunice, at this time, if you could, please go ahead and turn on the raised hand function for participants. And again, we'd ask that all participants who are interested in participating in the input opportunity to raise your hand so I can get a count on just how many there are and we can fine tune the amount of time that will be necessary. I see two hands up so far. I'll give a moment to see if more of those hands go up here in the interim. If you can't find the raise hand function, let us know via the Q&A pod and I'll include that in the count.
Okay. Um, seeing just two, we're going to give a, a maximum of three minutes um, for this public input. If you'd like to um, pose clarifying questions, um, we'll do our best to answer those, but may not be able to with the folks who are on the call today. So just um, want to make sure that we have um, level expectations on that front. We're going to go ahead and begin this process, and I will uh, integrate live public input with the Q&A uh, input that we've already received. So we'll sort of try to, to weave that in together as we move forward. Um, the first person that I see with a, a raised hand is Cyrus Reed. Cyrus, I'm going to go ahead and give you the opportunity to um, speak or to use your microphone if you encounter any issues. Use the Q&A pod to let us know. Also, please share your full name and affiliation so we know um, who you are and, and who you represent in, in providing your, your input. So Cyrus, you should have the ability to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Yeah, this is Cyrus Reed. I work in Austin, Texas with the Lone Star chapter. That's the state chapter of the Sierra Club. I'm the conservation and um, legislative director. Um, and I had had a question that I think was answered uh, in a subsequent presentation. Uh, we are generally in favor of the development of, of offshore wind, but obviously uh, location and mitigation measures are very important. You know, we share the concerns of the Texas Parks and Wildlife that we want to make sure that migratory birds and bats aren't impacted uh, and also have a concern about the the rice as well. But it seems like from the information, uh, the four areas being discussed would be outside any critical habitat designation that might come about. I did have a question just about the timing of when we expect, I guess it's not BOEM, it would be a separate agency, when we might expect uh, a uh, final critical habitat designation. I don't know what the what the timing, I don't know if that would impact this, this wind leasing activity. Uh, so that's sort of a question that you guys can either, you know, reach out to me at uh, cyrus.read at sierraclub.org if you're not able to answer today. Uh, but that so it's a general concern about making sure if we go forward with offshore wind in Texas, we're doing it in a way that doesn't impact, uh, uh, you know, important species, uh, both commercially, but also endangered species. Um, and then I, I want to agree uh, with the comments. I believe it was a gentleman from NOAA um, that to the extent these lease leases might also involve hydrogen production that we really need to be careful at looking at the impacts that hydrogen might have, particularly with uh, water and you know intake of water along the coast, which can also impact some of the same species and other activities. So just want to make sure that we're, as you guys go forward, that we're clear. If it's offshore wind for electricity, you know there's one set of uh, criteria we need to look at. But if it's for uh, the production of hydrogen that you need to take that into account uh, very carefully about potential impacts of, of the hydrogen production. Um, and then I also want to agree with them that it would make sense, uh, you know, going forward to do uh, some programmatic um, analysis uh, with you guys and with, I, th I believe it was from Noah. And if I got that wrong, I'm sorry, I was, I'm sort of multitasking here. Uh, but those are my comments and we'll be likely, you know, submitting some formal comments before the May 20th uh, deadline, along with some some other groups. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cyrus. And and I actually was wondering if, Kate Sagara, if you're on the line, uh, I think you maybe had seen the the question that Cyrus had posed earlier and, and might have some some feedback here. Yeah, sure. Um, Cyrus, hey, it's Kate Sagara, um, Biological Sciences Unit in BOEM. Nice. Thanks for your questions and your comments. Um, I will address the the rice as well question you had that I think you um, gathered from the slides, but just to reiter reiterate, the proposed critical habitat designation for rice as well was included as a constraint in the siting model, meaning that it, it was avoided. And so all of the draft and final WIAs that we've identified to date are outside of the proposed critical habitat area and are shoreward of that area. If and when a final uh, when the critical habitat is actually designated, we'll evaluate whether or not there's any overlap. 
with our WIAs, but we're not expecting that to occur. In terms of timing of the final designation, that would be a question to NOAA. I'm not able to answer. Thanks. And any of the NOAA task force members on the on the line, if you're able or have have a any thought about the timing on that designation, you can come off mute and and share. Otherwise, we'll um, capture it in the notes for follow up. Thank you, Kate. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. This is one of those places where I'm going to I'm going to incorporate one of the questions that we received before, and then Syed, uh, Khalil, you'll be up next. So we had received a, a question from Pasha from the Ocean Conservancy via Q and A that was, um, "Could Bohm please speak to why no conservation bid credits are included? Those were contemplated in the Central Atlantic PSN for application." in the 2024 leases. And I think Sarah Kaufman, perhaps you might be the right person to address that question. I can, thanks, thanks, Kyle, and thanks for the question. Um, so in the Central Atlantic PSN, you're correct, we did request information on conservation bidding credits as a potential bidding credit for future lease sales. Boehm received numerous comments, both in support and opposition for conservation bidding credits. The comments we received highlighted the need for additional stakeholder engagement on the topic, as well as questions on the structure and accessibility of conservation bidding credits. BOEM is going to continue to analyze those comments and identify future actions before including um, that we that we would need to consider um, when including it in a future lease sale. So that is something that BOEM is still considering, and we would still, you know, any comments that we receive, we will still um, consider as far as and how to how to potentially implement that in a future lease sale. Thanks, Sarah. And while you're here, maybe I could pose the other question that Pasha shared, and we could we could tackle them both at the same time. So um, the the her comment was the way that you were talking about fisheries mitigation credits, where if there's not enough in the fund from the big credits, additional funds could be required from project permitting. So if a condition of a project permitting would be fisheries compensation, could you please explain how this fund is additional or how this is not providing a bid credit for something that's a requirement of permitting? Yes, thanks. That's, that's also a very good question. Um, we do understand that there are concerns regarding the adequacy of funds available in the Fisheries Compensatory Mitigation Fund. Um, so once a co construction and operation plan is received, additional and detailed analyses are done of the potential economic impacts to fisheries, for both the fishers and the shoreside businesses. Um, those will be conducted and would inform, you know, would inform if additional funding is necessary. So that just want to provide the confidence that that does happen. Um, as far as why the bidding credit is then is then implemented, is the bidding credit provides the certainty to stakeholders that that money is set aside and that will happen. And another thing is that it um, it ensures, and it's because lessees are required um, to provide funding to um, address any immediate impacts that come from pre-construction activities. So activities that would occur on a lease before the construction and operations plan is done, for example, survey work, um, the, the fund then through the bidding credit provides those funds immediately um, to address those. So those are some of the reasons why it is um, it is done as a bidding credit. Thank you. Thank you. And Pasha, I just saw your hand go up. I think that's probably for a follow-up. So I'm going to, I'm going to just invite you to um, use your microphone now in case there's any clarification or additional input that you wanted to provide. Thank you. Yeah, that was exactly. It. And thank you, Sarah, for those answers. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding, Sarah, your answer there. So are you indicating that money from fisheries bidding credits from the developers is immediately put into a fund and not like upon issuance of the lease? Um, because, and I like heard previously that one of the like benefits of these kind of bid credits is that it can kind of space out the timing that developers have to pay, like both for the auction and then into these. But from what you just said there, it sounds like the bid credit, the funds that go into that fisheries compensation fund would be expected to be paid immediately. Is that correct? No, very, very good, very good clarification. I realize, and I, as I said it, that I, I a little bit conflated two things. So you are not required to set up your fisheries mitigation fund until five years after the lease or the submission of the first FDR. But what you are required to do is if there are any impacts that accrue to fishing communities before the fund is established, you are required to pay for those. So as far as like having to put the bulk contribution into the fund, that does happen later. 
but you are, as part of the credit, you are agreeing to cover any impacts that would occur before that fund is established. Got it. Thank you. It's helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Pasha. Um, you can always re-raise your hand if there's additional items. I'm going to move now to Syed Khalil. Syed, I know that you shared a couple of questions via the Q&A as well, so we're happy to tackle those as part of this or to, to cover those as part of this. You now have the ability to unmute yourself, so please go ahead. Yes, this is Syed Khalil from CPRA. Can you hear me? Tom? We can. We can. Good. So I have posted those uh, questions and I saw one of the slides, it said site characterization. And I was wondering if those things has taken into consideration these two questions I had, that subsurface geological setting and uh, as well as the superficial um, seabed characterization has been taken into account while you're doing that, that's number one. And then number two is that what are the steps you propose because we have been really struggling in our this uh, restoration community with the access to the sediment resources, which has been hampered or impaired by the pipelines which were laid all across the coastal Louisiana, and we don't want to repeat that thing again. So, what steps uh, Boom proposes to take up so that there is no conflict so far? The restoration community is concerned about the pipeline obstructing the seabed resources, yeah, especially thank, uh, sediment. Thank, thank you for both of those questions, Syed. And I, I think it's probably going to be two different people answering your question. So on your question about um, seabed site characterization, I'm, I'm wondering if um, Mariana Steen is on the line and could come off mute to, to address it. Hi, Mariana, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, Saeed, thank you so much for your question. Um, I actually recall you asking that question at the recent Gulf of Mexico conference in Tampa, and we actually took that back to our geologists in our resource and evaluation office and asked them that question, uh, whether or not we have available uh, subsurface and superficial geological data that could be incorporated into the NCOS siting model. And uh, what we were told was that we don't have a data set that is uh, at a fine enough resolution, you know, across the entirety of the call area to really inform the model at, at this time. Um, and so what will happen is that at the site characterization stage, uh, post lease issuance, uh, lessees will conduct a uh, more fine scale geological, you know, surface and uh, subsurface geological data collections that will be used to support engineering decisions. Thank you. So, yeah, I remember I posed this question and never got a reply. Maybe I missed it. So basically what I'm hearing from you is that once you have that, then only once you issue the lease, then they will be doing that characterization uh, and looking at those uh, information which is available. That's what that is, I'm hearing. That is correct. It'll be a combination of high resolution geophysical surveys and then also coring to to look at the subsurface uh, logic <laughs> okay okay to me it looks i mean no disrespect to anybody to me it looks like you're putting a card before the horse because what happens so my question will be what happens if you find that the site is not enameable to any uh, heavy structure or something like that then what happens if i may ask you you know, and we, I would say in addition to in addition to um, well, we we also included hard bottom data that we have available um, in the model as well. So those were also taken into consideration. And, and at this time, that is that is the best we can do. Okay, all right. Thank you for your question. Okay. Yeah, and, and Syed, I didn't want to lose track of the second question that you had asked, which is the steps Bohm takes to address um, conflict from mul multiple use. Um, within the Gulf. So, Adrissa Boubet, I think you're here and on camera to to, uh -huh. to answer that one. <laughs> hey, Syed, how are you? Good, Adrissa, go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Your microphone will cut in here in a moment. Okay. Yeah, uh, Syed, uh, as you know, uh, Marine Mineral Program is an important issue, yeah, mission for BOM. And as you know, the SSRA, the significant segment resources for BOM has been used 
uh, in our modeling and we use them in our constraint model. So that means uh, when we do our, when we did our model citing, uh, the significant segment resource were excluded from being part of the part part of the model. So no no activities, no renewable energy activities will be happening close to it on on all those uh, resources that has been identified by our marine mineral program. Yeah. Thank you, Edith. I really appreciate that. I I know this is a question which I have been raising uh, because I most of the time I know the answer, but I'm intentionally raising the question so that we should not lose sight of the importance of what is happening and how we are, especially in the restoration community, is uh, handicapped by that uh, any obstructions. And because we have to have the safety buffer and all this stuff, I'm not going to detail here. But I'm raising the question, I'm part of the SSRA because I help in develop SSRA to BOMA as well. So, but my point would be that you your will be, do you have any steps that, okay, you look at SSRA, but if there is a conflict, uh, is there any, any mitigation or anything which you have in your mind or just you will look at SSRA and deviate or do whatever you can do by then? I, I mean, you will cross the bridge when you come to, that's what that idea is or do you have any plan in ahead of that? That's what I'm just wondering. Yeah, so that's what that's what we have been doing. So whenever there's SSRA, we just make sure that we deviate from the from, from the SSRA area. So that's what we have been doing uh during the Gulf one one when we did the modeling and that's what we have done for this uh this uh this subsequent Gulf wind two as well. So just get uh avoid the SSRS areas because it's part of our mission is a bomb mission uh to have SSRS and we we plan to restore uh we use those sent to restore uh uh all all the state uh necessary uh yeah. uh project that they have so it's part of our mission so we try to 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 do it right by it. And and Syed I appreciate this conversation and and have have heard the importance of it. Um, I, I think what I would propose now is to make sure that we're able to work through all of the queue and then um, would encourage you to re-raise your hand just so that you can you can no, re-engage no, once I'm everyone's done. had a chance. <laughs> well, <I am> done. <laughs> well, the perfect timing. We appreciate it, Syed. Thank you. And then I'm gonna move now to Akbar Marvasti of, I believe, NOAA. And Akbar, I, I think you had um, posed a question in Q&A. So maybe you could um, provide your input here and then repose that question um, live and, and off of mute. You should have the ability to unmute yourself now. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, yes, I'm Akbar Marvasti, an economist with uh, Southeast Fisheries Science Center at NOAA. Uh, it is argued that development and operation of offshore wind energy turbines are likely to increase the risk of accidents for commercial fishermen. My question is whether uh, there are any compensation being considered for the increase in insurance premium as a result of higher rate of accidents. Someone from BOEM, Sarah, it looks like you're going to weigh in on that. Sarah is, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. I was muted. Um, thanks, thanks Dick, for that question. That's a really, a really good point. I think we have we have heard that um, before. Um, at the moment, the um, the language of the of the fishing compensatory mitigation fund does not include that. Um, but we would certainly welcome your comments and feedback um, through the public comment period on that and any specific information you have as far as the amounts of the insurance premiums and um, just any as much detail as you can provide us on that um, would be helpful that we could consider during the um, development of the final sale notice. Uh, yes, I, I need to find a way to communicate with the group. Uh, I will be happy to share some ideas with you. Wonderful. Yes, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, while we're on the topic of NIMS and fisheries, we have a question for Andy Strelchek. Andy, I, I'm not sure if you're still on the line, but if you are, this one was directed to you. Um, they were wondering if you might speak directly about, directly and briefly about NIMPS 
post 2021 and ongoing data collection efforts. And if you have updated or plan to update the model that you used circa 2021 for the wind energy area. Yeah, so I'm going to phone a friend and see if uh, NCOS is actually on the line. Um, what I can say is uh, my office, National Marine Fisheries Service, we contributed to the data layers for that model. Um, and we certainly believe that it's important that given the dynamic environment of the Gulf of Mexico, that, that be updated periodically with new data and information. But would love if uh, NCOS is on the line to speak more directly to updating of the model. Anyone from NCOS on the line, go ahead and come off mute if you're a task force member. If you're just an attendee, you can raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. I'm not sure if we have any. Hey. Yeah, hey all, this is this is Joshua, Chastain Marine Planning Coordinator um, for NCOS for the Gulf. Um, I think the short answer here is is yes, at every opportunity before each round or, you know, for the first round and then before the second round, um, data is, is refreshed and um, we work with with all types of different agencies, including some internal and some external to make sure that we've got um, the most pertinent and latest and greatest data that we use before um, we even start the modeling process. So the answer to that question, if, if I heard it and understood it correctly, is yes. And I believe Joe Thacker, you asked that question. So if there's any follow-up or clarification, please don't hesitate to, to raise your hand. I saw a hand shoot up there. Joe, you've, you've got the ability to unmute yourself. All right, I think I'm on mute, but I don't know if you can see my camera or not. You, we can't see you, but we are hearing you. Okay, great. Well, so thank you, Josh. I appreciate that information. Uh, you know, I've heard through the grapevine that you guys are doing a number of studies uh, in the Gulf, and I was curious about um, if you can speak to what those studies are revolving around, um, particularly as it relates to offshore wind. Um, everybody be patient with me. I've, I've been in this position for about uh, four months. Uh, hey, James, did you happen to hear that? Um, did you happen to hear that question this time from Joe? Hey, Joe, uh, go ahead and ask the question again. Well, I was just asking James in particular about specific studies that you guys are doing. Um, I think we've talked, I've talked to you about some work that we're doing with the state of Louisiana, and I'm just curious about, you know, if if any of those data are going to be available to us and really what, what the new data you're gathering are. You talk about spatial data studies? Yeah, yeah just, do, yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, we're just working to try to keep the, our our Gulf of Mexico geo database up to date. So, um, like I said, we brought on Joshua there as a regional coordinator for the Gulf of Mexico, and he's going through every data layer in the geo database that we've used in previous work, and making sure that it's as up to date as possible, as well as mining for any kind of new data. Um, we think about our geo databases being living geo databases, so that constant sort of contact with all the different stakeholders and federal agencies and state agencies so that when BOEM moves forward with the planning action, we we have, you know, fresh data there. We also have, of course, you know, work that's happening within NOAA, within the Ocean Service and NCOS in terms of biogeographical assessments, as well as work that's happened, of course, within NIMPS on, uh, on all of the NIMPS um, trust resources, you know, th that's happening as well. And Andy and, and NOAA and others can speak to that. So, if you have a specific um, data type or or issue uh, relative to spatial data, be happy to kind of look at that and give you an update on where we are with the latest um, data. Okay, I'll reach out to you separately. All right, thanks. Thank you. And great to see all the coordination happening amongst NOAA on the call. Um, we did receive a directed question through chat from a. Um, from a, um, a member who asked the question, as far as the percentage cap on bidding credits, is that cap based on the current market? We would like to know if there is documentation on how that cap was determined and if it aligns with current market forces. That was Camille, um, who we heard from earlier, who asked that question. And, and Sarah, um, yep, you're back. wonder if you might want to tackle that. 
Sure. Um, I, I think we might have tackled it earlier, um, but I can, I'm happy to, to talk about it again. Um, we we do have some material on our website on the leasing and grant page um, that were some papers that were written by our auction contractor that just talk about multiple factor options and the kind of the, the economic theory around how you design the auctions and, and bidding credits. So those do highlight, you know, that you don't want bidding credits to be too large because you don't want them to impact the competitiveness of the auction. So should someone not receive a bidding credit, um, that it would kind of eliminate them from being able to win it. So that's one of the reasons why we, we've set the bidding credit cap where we have. Um, and then also we, um, fair market, you know, we have to receive fair return to the taxpayer. Um, and so we balance you know, these other requirements and mandates in the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act with the requirement and the mandate that we receive fair return. Um, and so 25% allows us to do both. It allows us to provide resources um, and then also return to the treasury. So I would say that the kind of the 25% amount, it kind of recognizes market value because it's a percentage of whatever the market determines that the value of the lease is um, by, by providing a portion of that back to the treasury and then a portion of that to the um, to the bidding credits. And of course that amount is gonna vary depending on where the lease is, how much the bid is, um, but that it still provides the an appropriate split between treasury and bidding credits. And while I have you here, we had another question on the credit percentage cap. And that question was if Breeze or the RISE Act pass out of Congress, would the revenue sharing model potentially change the bidding credit percentage cap? as it relates to the taxpayer balance? Yes, thank you. That's a great question. Um, we are aware that there are different bills being discussed in Congress now that do address revenue sharing and bidding credits. Um, I believe one of them specifically limits Bohm's ability to do bidding credits um, and, and then also provides revenue sharing. So we are, we are certainly watching those. And um, of course, our actions will depend on um, how the bill is viewed and the wording um, and the language interpreted by our solicitor's office. And we will certainly reevaluate bidding credits and caps as appropriate um, in, if, in the event that any of those become law. Thanks, Sarah. And if Camille or Spring want to ask follow-up questions or provide input about those responses, um, you can use the raise hand function and we'd be happy to, to include that. While we wait to see if anything happens there, I'm gonna go to an, another, it looks like it's a question that was posed um, in the Q&A function. This question comes from Michelle uh, Van Deventer. Um, it says, regarding potentially prescribing layouts for the lease areas, if the EA did not cover specific project layouts, could BOEM provide additional details about how turbine layout could be prescribed without triggering additional environmental assessment needs? And the question from Michelle is going to Michelle from BOEM, and it looks like you're already spotlighted. So um, yeah, please. Hi, Michelle, thank you for that question. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on the NEPA process for the uh, this uh, offshore wind. Uh, the, the first uh, NEPA that we did, the environmental assessment, only covered the, the site assessment and site characterization activities that could occur. Um, so that would include the installation of meteorological buoys um, and, and uh, biological surveys and vessel trips. Um, and that that is where that NEPA stopped. So then um, should a lessee obtain a lease, then um, they would do those um, the site assessment and site characterization activities. So they'd install a buoy and collect data on wind and currents, and they do their biological sampling. Um, and once they have enough data, if they determine that they, they want to move forward and the data gave them um, you know, the information they wanted to uh, propose a project, then they would submit a construction and an operations plan to BOEM. Um, and then BOEM would uh, review that plan and uh, we would conduct uh, an environmental impact statement based on the turbine layouts in that plan and the transmission lines. Um, so uh, BOEM is actually analyzing the information that the, uh, the lessee provided in their COP. Um, I, I'm not sure this is exactly the question you were asking. So if I didn't answer what you were asking, please, uh, you know, let me know and we could, uh, I could try to clarify. <laughs> Michelle, it looks like you're still on the line. So if that's the case or you want to um, discuss further, just raise your hand and we're happy to, to um, loop you into the discussion. And there's the hand. 
you should be able to unmute yourself now. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. I guess maybe then, um, and and certainly I can do some more homework on the the register notice, but perhaps the question would be better asked of Boehm how prescriptive the the layout would be for the entire area, um, since um, that seems like that would have a lot of implications for uh, cumulative imp impacts, particularly if lessees are able to um, bid and acquire more than one lease area and develop simultaneously. So, uh, so uh, just to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm understanding, are you asking if Boehm actually tells the lessee how to lay out the turbines? Because I don't think we do that. <laughs> Yes, thank you. I when I was okay. reading, Yes, thank you. That was my understanding from reading the um the the comments, the request for comments is whether there should be uniform or aligned prescribed layouts for the lease areas. I got gotcha. you. Okay. And I'm going to let Renee come on cuz uh, she's more familiar with the PSN, I'm more familiar with the NEPA, so she probably gotcha. has a better answer thank you. for you. But thank you Renee. Thank you. <laughs> Hi Michelle. Um Yes, we do take comments on whether they would, you know, what people feel about that. So then we take the comments, we will have a response to comment document, but basically we determine how we move forward a lot of times from the input we receive. Thank so you. Does, does that answer your question? I know it's yeah, not I, like an answer answer, but yeah. Yes, it helps me frame the kinds of questions that we might want to investigate further. So I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Michelle. We have two questions remaining. Um, both have been posed in the Q&A pod. Um, if you would like to get into the queue, you can raise your hand and we'd be happy to um, add you to the list of, of folks to provide input. The first question that we're going to um, work through is a question that was sent to me directly via chat. And that question was, um, does the lease sale also include for potential offshore carbon capture and storage? If so, is the process for commenting similar regarding site characterization and then uh, COP process? I believe that Mike Salata, you were gonna, you were gonna field this question. Yeah, hi, um, I'm Mike Salata. I am a senior advisor with Bohm's Gulf of Mexico office. So the lease process is, as we've discussed, is strictly uh, wind energy leases with the possibility of uh, hydrogen production. Uh, Bohm has authority on the carbon sequestration, but currently uh, Bohm is going through a rulemaking process. And so those in theory, uh, when that is done will be separate leases and a separate lease process. And I can't recall who posed that question. Sarah, Sarah Krupa, Louisiana DNR, um, posed that question. So Sarah, if you have any additional topics that you'd like to work through with Mike, this is your opportunity. Raise your hand or come off mute. Uh, th thank you, Kyle. Uh, that answered my question. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you and good to see you on the meeting. Um, we just received another question in the Q&A pod. That question is likely to go to a DT or right. So just giving you a heads up. It's up in the New York Byte lease auction. Bohm's progress report requirement was extended to underserved communities potentially affected by proposed activities to enhance efforts for early and regular engagement. Is it Bohm's intent that the requirements for reporting and enhanced engagement by Gulf of Mexico leases also extend to underserved communities? Um, I need to look specifically at the language you're referring to. It, it, it is reminding me of, some, of a draft provision in the draft programmatic EIS that was published for the New York Byte leases. Um, that was not part of the lease sale, however, so that's not, and that it's still in draft form, so that's not uh, binding. In any case, we are we are very interested in ensuring that lessees are um, taking 
um, underserved communities into account and that uh, EJ concerns are, are being addressed. So th this is something that will absolutely be considered in environmental impact statements and um, and reviews. So I, I, um, I don't know exactly what, uh, where the uh, stipulations or the terms and conditions of any uh, any approvals will will require specifically, but it is an issue that we're attuned to and paying it and concerned with. Thanks, right? And thank you, Sarah, for your question. Same thing. Um, if you'd like to uh, provide input based off of that response, you can do so by raising your hand. Uh, continue the conversation. And while Sarah's potentially looking for that raise hand function, um, I would just acknowledge that we don't have any more items in the queue. It looks like we've worked through all of the um, pieces of input we've received through the Q&A pod. We also don't have any raised hands at this time. So I'm, I'm gonna pause for a moment to see if there are people variously trying to finish up anything that they're putting in the Q&A pod, into the chat pod, or if anyone is, is looking to find that raise hand function. Okay. Eunice, if you could please pull up the slide that includes contact information for any um, follow up discussion. So we just wanted to uh, put this up on the screen momentarily or, or um, for a limited amount of time for folks to see that information. Renee, who's um, right now spotlighted with me, um, will be the point of contact for any of the substantive uh, discussions or, or follow-up questions that may come. Her email, renee.bigner at boehm.gov, is included up on that slide as a reminder these slides will be made available, so you don't need to remember or write down that email. They will be posted on Bohm's website, so you can capture that information. If you are a member of the media who is on the line and you have media inquiries or follow-up, we'd ask that you um, contact Hillary McKee or John Phyllis Strat. Both of their emails are on included on the slide right now as well. And we can go forward one slide. And actually one more beyond that. Um, I wanted to remind folks that if they wanted to leave a formal public comment on the proposed sale notice, you should do so through regulations.gov. That link has been shared on multiple occasions in the chat. And I really appreciate your time and participation through this meeting. I'm gonna hand it now to Renee to close down the public comment, uh, public input opportunity uh, period of the meeting. I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us and having questions and, and moving this discussion forward. And that is all I have. Well, thank you. You've got the contact information <laughs> if there's anything else. Otherwise, this meeting is uh, formally um, adjourned and we'll get the meeting summary and the meeting recording posted to Bohm's website as soon as possible. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>